Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. My name is Michael Waits, and we're talking from the Asia Tech Podcast Stories. I'm calling Peter, who is in Tokyo. I am in Bangkok. Peter, good morning. Hey, Michael. Good morning. How are you? Let's go back to this. So I think it's actually shocking that we've never met, and I'll tell you why. Um, you have been in Japan since when? 1990? 90. Exactly. So so was I. <laughs> so I landed in okay. I, right. land, I landed in February on February twentieth of nineteen ninety. My first day in the offices of Morgan Stanley in Tokyo was February twenty first. So I didn't okay. even, I didn't even get a break. Um, <laughs> I was living in a small apartment in Hatagaya, which is familiar probably to you, but probably to very few other people listening to this podcast. And sure. I I left at the end of two thousand and eleven, and you can probably do the math and figure out why. Right. Um, so why don't we just go through a little bit of your background yes. as well, and then we can talk about all of the sort of fascinating things that you've been doing in the tech sector and in other sectors since 1990. Sure. Uh, well, as you as you mentioned, I, I came to to Japan in around 1990, and uh, I came as a student. Uh, at that time, Japan was uh, very much focused on becoming the leader in in, uh, in all things computer. Right. Uh, my at that time, I, I was. Uh, uh, doing my master thesis and I was focusing on uh, things like massive parallel computing and guess what artificial intelligence uh, that's more than 20 you know that's, that's quite a while ago now but uh, uh, that was kind of my starting point and uh, being new to Japan uh, I worked at a research laboratory which was uh, part of Hitachi one of their, their Hitachi in Kokobunji uh, may be familiar to you. Very. Not familiar to everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Kokobunji and, is not a place probably that everybody else is going to know, but fair right, enough. Right, right. But Hitachi has its biggest research lab there, and um, I was a researcher there for almost two years, uh, focusing on you know uh, basically combination of hardware and software and uh, what was called semantic processing at that time. Right. Uh, and uh, shortly uh, after, you know, kind of my uh, my thesis work was done and my research work was over, I stumbled into the financial uh, technology world. I joined Citibank uh, in the early 90s, and I've been ever since basically working on the edge of technology and, and financial uh, the financial world. Uh, some people call it fintech today, so yeah. uh, but that is more or less what I've been doing most of the time. So, uh, Right, so I always think like when we were building trading systems back in 1994, was that fintech or is there not? <laughs> Well, you know, that's kind of something uh, I, I sometimes uh, try to explain to people that, you know, we can call it fintech, you can call anything fintech if you like, but I think, so. uh, but I think, I think it's a little bit more than that. So, you know, just, just being in that space doesn't really justify. I think what we were doing in those days was really focusing on how do we use technology to automate things that were happening, you know, in, in, in the bank or in the trading companies. And, uh, and, you know, financial industry has been very, very uh, creative in using technology because it's all, you know, as most people don't realize, there's no money. It's all in, in computers. Right. And it requires a tremendous amount of engineering to make sure that it all stays safe and, and, uh, and balances every day. So the amount of technology we, we were using was significant. If you were in the training space, of course, you had, you know, training dealing systems, advanced telephone systems. Uh, you, know, you know, reducing the speed of transact, you know, the, the, making things really fast, all those things were there. And I think that was really kind of the first wave of, you know, of, of that type of, of those things happening. What most people don't realize is that the ATM uh, uh, is now 50 years old. Right. It was invented in 1967. And uh, so that was kind of, you know, if you go back in, in history, you will see that the financial industry always have kind of brought out all kind of innovations uh, quite ahead of, of things. When I was at Citibank, we actually used uh, user interfaces for the ATM that uh, were actually predates what Citibank was doing on the internet. But once the internet came, they already had all the understanding of building this kind of UIs on ATMs and they put it on the internet. So uh, quite interesting. Most people also won't know that Citibank actually manufactured its own ATMs up to about, I think, about 10, 12 years ago. So... Uh, interesting, you know, interesting historical context. Yeah, and I also think just as interesting as well, if you think about the context of when ATMs were introduced, right, so what were the automatic teller, people don't know kind of what the name stands for, right, the T in, right. The, in the ATM, but there was also yes. a lot of noise back then around the ATMs replacing human workers and what was going to happen to bank branches and 
all of this sort of interesting commentary around what was going to happen right. to humans in the context of banking and that the humans were going to disappear from branches. Right. And that didn't happen, which kind of leads me to today in a way. I, right. I hear a lot of conversations about what is, you know, what's going to happen now to human workers. Will they be replaced by robots? And frankly, an ATM is just a robot in a weird shape. Yes, and, and, and you know, and this is kind of you know, kind of a wieldy white topic. But if you look, if, if we just focus on the financial industry, as you were saying, ATMs didn't replace the teller. Uh, if you look at Japan specifically, Japan was a very early adapter of, very. of uh, ATM technology, and actually was one of the most uh, you know uh, advanced countries in terms of cash recycling and doing lots of things at the ATM. Uh, it did take away some of the uh, activity from from the teller, but the teller always stayed. Uh, there and doing similar things. Uh, it's only till very recently in Japan that ATMs actually work outside of branch hours. When I, I came gonna, to Japan, I was going to say, I used to, I used to go down to the bank at like four o'clock on a right. Friday afternoon to the Citibank branch in the Ote Center building to get cash yes. for the weekend because it wasn't yes. open on Saturday. Yes, exactly. And when, when it was at Citibank, we worked very hard to turn it into, uh, you know, weekend weekend connectivity and uh, 24 by 7. But the real problem was is that Citibank was part of the bank's network, uh, and it wasn't really Citibank. It were the other banks that would not be uh, available. So, uh, so but we started to offer a cash uh, withdrawal and deposit on the weekends and then 24 by 7, etc. But it could only happen on Citibank ATMs, and as you know, Citibank had a relatively small ATM network. Yes. But it was very, but it was very strong in overseas ATM. So the whole idea behind the 24 by 7 ATM wasn't so much. Uh, withdrawing cash in Japan, but it was really you know the service for for Citibank's customers to go abroad, and then wherever they are, in what time zone they are, always be able to withdraw cash. And that was kind of one of the one of, one of the uh, you know selling points of, of the Citibank account uh, in in those days. So the convenience uh, that we now kind of start to take for granted. It took so many many years for other banks to follow, and even now, most Japanese banks are are scrambling to do something because I think they all want to. Uh, have something in place before before the Olympics in terms of servicing you know overseas customers. So you see, if you go to a big Mizuho branch or whatever, you'll find uh, uh, in a corner you'll find an ATM that says you can withdraw uh, uh, overseas cash on this ATM and not the other ones. So you know if you look at it, very very uh, much glacier speed in terms of that type of innovation. But if you look at what's happening in some. Um, in terms of what the teller is doing, in, if you go to Europe or whatever, increasingly uh, branches are being closed down. And that's not because of the teller machines. It's because of people are able to do their banking business over their mobile phones. Right. And I think that the mobile phone really is the one that, that killed the teller, not so much the robot or the automated teller machine. So it's kind of interesting to think about that. You know, it's, you know sometimes automating the, the, the thing you're doing may not be... Uh, the end to a means. It could be a complete different way of having that service that takes care of that service or experience. So, right, and if, like you said, I think if you consider the fact that the ATM was invented back in the 60s, really became ubiquitous in the 70s and early 80s, and in Japan didn't even become a 24-7 service until the 2000s, because I remember we used to use Citibank as kind of our backup. Most of us, right. got, most of us got paid into an, an automatic account in New York. Okay, and when City went to 24 hours with their with their ATM machines, it was like a paradigm change in the way we could live our lives on the weekend. Absolutely, I'm not kidding. Absolutely, I know that no, absolutely. Silly, though. Yes, um, but you know, if you think about it, you know, it, it's it's lots of progress, but it is also lots of progress over lots of lots of amount of time. Yes, and that's kind of what makes banking interesting because it is a very complex, uh, you know, uh, thing. And now with fintech and all these things happening today, there is so much activity that is trying to find uh, ways around it. Uh, uh, that, and that makes it really interesting to me. Yeah, and I guess you've been lucky is probably the wrong word, but you've been able to experience some really interesting things. I mean, back in the day, right, Shinsei Bank was one of the Japanese banks that was – was that a Ripplewood purchase, if I remember correctly? <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly correct. Right, so, was, uh, so Ripplewood was, went in and bought Shinsei. Did you know John Fletcher, by the way? Uh, I'm not familiar with John. No. Okay, because John was obviously, I think, obvi also in tech at um, – at, uh, at Shinsei, but one of the foreign banks, if I remember. I mean, one of the Japanese banks that was bought by one of the foreign um, companies. Anyway, but okay. what, what you saw probably at Shinsei was a big introduction of technology, which it looks like you were leading at the time. Is that not correct? Yes, yes. So actually, uh, after spending uh, 
close to 10 years with City, uh, the opportunity to join uh, Shinsei Bank was a one, once in a lifetime. Yes. Uh, you know, as for maybe for the for the listeners, uh, Shinsei Bank uh, came out of the bankruptcy of the Long Term Credit Bank of Japan, which was one of the three leading industrial banks that after their after the, the Second World War was over, were really commissioned to provide, um, you know, basically unlimited amounts of cash to Japanese industry to grow. And it had a specific uh, law that protected it uh, from other banks and it could offer higher interest and lower tax or whatever to make uh, deposits very, very profitable for people who deposit primarily, actually for corporate depositors. And then it would use that to basically fund the growth of companies like Toshiba, Hitachi, Sony, etc. Right. So it was a very, very important, very large bank. And uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, when uh, lots of things were under pressure, it was kind of, you know, kind of a slow, you know, the, the bubble had kind of a, was kind of a super pressure cooker that really slowly deflated. And the long-term credit bank was one of the, one of the very few big victims of that. And this is a, it's one of the very rare, rare, rare occasions in Japan that the bank went bankrupt. Yep, I remember. And, uh, and it was a big thing. And so added with bankruptcy, uh, when the Japanese government was looking for a buyer, uh, as you mentioned, Ripplewood was the consortium of <coughs> foreign investors that, uh, took over the bank from the government, and uh, with that came, uh, you know, kind of a mandate to to rebuild a new bank out of the uh, remainders of Long Term Credit Bank. Long Term Credit Bank was really a very much a corporate bank. It didn't have much of investment banking, nor no. did it have retail, retail banking. And so, and so my my attraction was to you know to get an opportunity to go really from scratch uh, and see what we could we could do both in terms of corporate and investment bank, but specifically in terms of retail banking. Yeah, and do you want to talk a little bit about the founding of Monex as well? I remember the, when Monex Securities, the whole Monex, yes. was it Mon- Monex Beans actually back in the day, right? Well, no, it wasn't Monex Beans. Nico but, Beans, but, sorry. Uh, no, Nico Beans, right. So, yeah. so very correctly, around the same time, I think it's 1999, uh, Monex was founded. And Monex really came, uh, was founded by Oki Matsumoto. Yep. And he was a Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, Goldman Sachs partner. And... Uh, uh, he took the uh, also the one time in a live opportunity when the deregulation happened of of the over the counter uh, market for for security brokerage. He took the chance to create an online broker. Uh, he was not alone. Uh, there are a few other online brokers that started around the same time, like uh, SBI or Kaba.com, etc. Uh, but he took yes, and uh, so so okay went. Uh, and created a team, uh, and he got investors, including uh, uh, Sony, etc. And he set up the, one of the first online retail brokers in Japan. Um, uh, that kind of is a parallel story to what happened at Shinsei. Uh, actually, Oki was one of the uh, external directors of, of Shinsei Bank during some, uh, the first first ten years. Um, and it was really, you know, really, you know, online uh, retail broker is kind of a hundred percent online online business. Similar to Shenzhen, when we started uh, our retail banking, we really focused only on the internet. And uh, if you may remember, year 2000 kind of sounds like, you know, internet was there, internet was there, but people had a hard time to believe that we would have voice over IP. Yeah. Uh, people had a hard time to believe that we could do banking over the internet. Uh, this is pre, uh, you know, pre-smartphones. At that time, we were still very, very much excited about iMode. Right. Uh, which kind of had so much potential uh, at that time. I remember it well, uh, actually. Right. Yes. So you know, we built interfaces with uh, with Docomo to do uh, the first uh, you know mobile mobile banking in Japan and stuff like that. And and so so that, those were kind of the the heydays of uh, you know lots of greenfield. You could basically you know be you could be the first in almost anything at that time. Yeah. And uh, which we were with Shinsei Bank. We did things that that nobody else had done. You know, to, just to go back to our, our funny story about ATMs. I think we were the first and still the only bank in Japan. And, you know, I'm not working anymore, but at that time we were the only bank in Japan that uh, removed all teller uh, equipment and activity from the teller counter. And we didn't remove the people, but we uh, we needed to do that because we wanted to have the people behind the counter help customers, uh, you know, with their investment strategies and stuff like that. And we just moved all of that activity to the ATM uh, inside the branch, but. Uh, behind the counter, there you would not see a single piece of cash. So I think so. Some of those things were um, uh, very uh, interesting to do. So you, how do you change your whole interaction model with customers 
instead of having them pull a number at the entrance, how do you welcome them and say what you know what do you want to do with your money right. instead of you know uh, you know take a number and get out of here right so <laughs> it's kind of like a hospital right a so bit. I think there were lots of things and I think Oki did did the same thing you know he he focused on how can I. Uh, uh, how can I create an amazing experience online for people to uh, to trade? And uh, you know, I think Monix has uh, very much succeeded in that. They have. I mean, they were clearly one of the pioneers in the fact that I think it was actually one of the first of these online companies to list on the TSE as well. Is that not correct? Yes, because they merged with uh, Nico Beans, I, I believe. Uh, yes. So, so that so exactly. So, what happened is, is after I think it, I don't have the numbers right, but around two thousand four or five or something. Uh, uh, Nico Beans emerged with, uh, with you know with, with Monix, and uh, and that created uh, you know it was kind of a an or you know inorganic growth strategy, and that created uh, an even bigger broker uh, after that. So it allowed uh, Monix to uh, expand its uh, its customer reach, but also it, some people may not know it. It also allowed them to get access to a, a better uh, platform. So they migrated all the customers on what. Uh, Nico Beans was using right. as a technology, right. and that allowed it to grow further. Very interesting. And I'll say this: if as if your as if your professional life wasn't interesting enough up until now, <laughs> then you went to Keio University. Well, and that's so, kind of something. Yes. Well, I didn't go in terms yeah, of no, left my job. And, your job. And, you went there, and like, were you really working on the blockchain back in two thousand and eight? No, no, of course not. We didn't. That I didn't, didn't, think exist. So. didn't exist. Yeah, I didn't think so. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> was about was about to be born, but right. no. Uh, my uh, affiliation with Keio actually uh, uh, dates from uh, the work we were doing at Shinsei Bank. And one of the things we focused on almost from the beginning of year two thousand was how can we use the internet for everything we do in the bank. And uh, some people may not uh, realize, but even today, many banks are very much uh, using. Um, what are called the dedicated lines. You know, you're all familiar with this. Lease lines. Lease lines. In those days, ISDN lines were typically <laughs> used as backups. Yep. And lease lines were basically physical pieces of copper that would connect you between, let's say, the head office and the branches and stuff like that. Right. And what most, you know, what's kind of interesting in today's, you know, in, in, if you think about it today, uh, you know, that copper is there's no encryption, nothing on that. Nothing. But you would you would assume it was very safe because NTT or your telephone company was in charge of that line, and therefore it must be very safe. Uh, we know a whole lot better today that you know that is very much wishful thinking. And uh, but in those days, that's were kind of the assumptions. Also, it gave you, it gave you kind of uh, a certain uh, you know guarantee about the capacity you would get through the line. So what we started to do is we said, well, you know, the internet is actually a very redundant network. Um, you know, it, it sometimes may not connect, but overall, you always get a connection. So, how can we use that technology to do everything we do in the bank? So, uh, how do we connect uh, the branches over the internet? How do we connect to the customer over the internet? How do we put the whole call center on uh, on IP? So, no uh, fixed, you know, no right. traditional telephony. All those things. So, we've been working on that uh, throughout Shinsei, uh, Shinsei's day. So, why, when uh, somewhere around 2008, uh, uh, in, in Keio, there is a very famous professor, Ju Morai, and he's kind of seen as the father of the internet in Japan. And so he really was one of the pioneers in the very early days that put the first, you know, for, first access points in and started to build out, uh, you know, all the, the, literally the backbone of the internet and then all the things that connected around it. And he collected lots of people at Keio University that, that helped them with that, but he also created a consortium of, of industry companies and, and, uh, and researchers in other universities that started to focus on building the internet. And that wow. project is still alive. It's called the WIDE project. Okay. And, um, uh, and that kind of started in 2008. That started well before 2008. But in 2008, what I sensei was introduced to is by Joe Ido, and he said, you know, go talk to these uh, to these guys because they're doing something exciting in the banking space. So in, in June, when he saw what we were doing, he said, wow, you know, nobody is really trying to do that in the banking world. So he wanted to really bring us in and, and share what we were doing. And so we did some more experiments, and we, we, we started working on that. So that kind of got me uh, connected into that. Uh, you mentioned blockchain. Um, blockchain wasn't wasn't there at, at, in those days, but right. uh, if you talk about distributed trust or, or building things that uh, are not centralized, some of those those concepts are not entirely uh, alien to myself. No. Right? So we're in, in the bank, uh, I, if you remember, you had uh, you have the concept of maker and checker. 
which was kind of a very primitive version of how do you have one person do something and another person verify that it's correct. And in a distributed trust network, that's more or less what you're doing. You basically have people say. check each other and you keep that in, in, in balance. But it is done in a, in a way more uh, a comprehensive manner using, uh, you know, very advanced crypto, cryptography. Right. And, uh, you know, in, uh, if you go 10 years ago, 50 years ago, lots of that stuff actually existed in terms of, you know, technology or, or concept. But the, the speed things took and uh, the, uh, the ability to do this really fast and didn't exist. So I think we have gone, uh, uh, gone a long way. So my connection to blockchain is more, is more recently. Uh, over the last few, uh, few years, I've been very much interested, obviously, in, in what that could do, not only in terms of Bitcoin or financial, but in general, right. how can you use uh, a the distributed ledger? Yeah. How do you, how a do distributed you use, ledger. Right. Yeah. How do you use a blockchain distributed ledger to figure out how it interacts with an entire financial system, I think is really a fascinating conversation. Yes, and yes but... Go ahead. Yes. No, go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry. So it's not only the financial system. Of course. You can use it... Um, there's many, many other application areas, I think, which we have not touched yet in, right. in society where we can uh, uh, bring in much more reliable digital bookkeeping than, than we have today. So I think we're just scratching the service. And uh, this year, uh, uh, last end of last year, uh, what I sensei at KO started a, a blockchain lab, and I was very happy uh, uh, to, to join that. But this, uh, just last month, uh, that kind of evolved into uh, a new initiative, very much similar to the White project I talked about. Mm -hmm. It's called Base, and it's the same idea. It's again, it's an academic, uh, uh, the focused network of researchers, not contained to KO, but other universities, uh, like to uh, like Tokyo University, etc. But also will bring in industry leaders to kind of create a consortium and to focus in Japan on, on blockchain technologies. And uh, specifically, not, not just the financial industry, but very much cross industries, trying to find possible application uh, areas and do more research around the core technology and, and see how we can make that uh, re robust and, and scalable for, for, many, uh, for many generations to come. Yeah, I mean, I, in a way, I don't even want to talk about the blockchain, and I'll tell you why. I mean, I do, but I don't, and I'll tell you why, because I feel like, and maybe we can talk now about you coming back on the show and talking more about the technology around the blockchain, and I'll tell you why. I spent a lot of time actually doing my own research on mm -hmm. the blockchain, um, the technology itself, but also its implication on a larger society. And like you said, it's more than just something that people can use to create cryptocurrencies. The concept of a distributed ledger and the impact that it's going to have on potentially all facets of life where you know, technology is now ubiquitous, but in, even in places where technology isn't ubiquitous, how it's going to impact there this whole concept of verification um, you know, electricity use, whatever, the whole concept of what's going on in the right. blockchain. And also, you know, there's the original blockchain on which Bitcoin sits, there's Ethereum, there are a whole, you know, whole host of companies using the blockchain for things for which it was never potentially intended. If you go back and read the white, the original white paper on it, um, which I'm sure you have. Right. But we, you know, there's a lot of ink has been spilt already on this, but most of that ink has been spilt by people that have no idea what they're talking about. So it'd be really interesting for me and you, I think, to get back on a call maybe later and spend some time really talking about this and digging deeper because this is a subject that's really um, close to me. We, you know, I don't, you know, a guy named Robert Hogan. So Robert was actually set up. He was a, a guy at Deutsche Bank that I worked with and also worked with him okay. at Morgan Stanley. But Robert's done a lot of work. Um, one of the you know greatest minds that I've met in in a long time. And I actually set up Robert to speak at a tech conference in Southeast Asia, particularly on this topic. And I don't think most of the audience actually understood because this was about three, maybe four years ago now. right? So people hear blockchain and just think of Bitcoin. And maybe if they're smarter, smarter, they think of Ethereum. But I think the conversation around this is so much deeper than just yes. sort of the surface level of you know cryptocurrency. So I, I, yes. you know, I want to talk about it so badly because I have so many... I have a lot mm -hmm. of opinions on it, and if you go back and listen to some of our previous podcasts, you'll hear us talking about it. Frankly, we talked about it last night, again, on our weekly podcast, and I think there's room to spend more time talking about it and to have an expert like you, particularly someone who's been in the sort of fintech, and I don't want to pigeonhole this just for fintech, because I agree with you. It's a much larger right, and but, much wider... Right, but just in the fintech people. space, I can it's definitely so talk huge. about it. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's huge, right? It's, but now, I want to ask you this, right, because... Again, I look at your profile and I see something really interesting. In March of 2011, you founded SafeCast. 
Yes. And uh, so I want to. I think I. I think I know, but I'd rather have you talk about the genesis of that company, what what it's been doing for the last eleven years, and kind of what the impact, not just on you know the gathering of data and radiation. Right. But the impact on, on you personally, so why did you go out and start this? Where were you on March 11th, um, 2011, and how did that impact the founding and sort of the continuous running of SafeCast, if that makes sense? Yes. Uh, so uh, let's start with the, with the first, uh, where was I on yeah. uh, March 11, two, you know, March 11, 2011? And uh, uh, I was in Tokyo. Uh, where were you to actually, to, together, actually, I was at home at that time. And uh, when when the earthquake uh, uh, Interesting. struck, Interesting and I've been home. living in yeah, I was at home and uh, and uh, uh, I've been living in Japan for you know over twenty five years right. and you know we experienced the occasional good good earthquake. shake but never anything like that right and <laughs> literally you know uh, and it's in Tokyo so literally the earthquake was you know four hundred kilometers away so you know just ima- you know I know what, just imagine that what the epicenter was felt like for in, people in Sendai there must have. Yeah, in Sendo must have been it's tremendous, true. right? Yeah. So the, the um, so I never forget. You, you never know when it stops, and it kept on going, kept on going. We were under the table and everything, and then uh, after it was over, we switched on the TV, and then it said, you know, uh, it's it's hit Tohoku, and it, it hit uh, uh, Miyagi Prefecture. Now right. it so happens that my my wife's uh, family-in-law. Is is from that area and actually right. from a city called Ishinomaki, right. which was one of the worst hit cities uh, in, the, in the tsunami. So when we switched on the TV, we saw the you know helplessly we saw the waves hit uh, uh, my, my wife's hometown and other people's hometowns and everything. So first of all, very big helpless feeling. Uh, uh, long, ter- long long story short, we lost contact with our family. Uh, they they were affected by the by the tsunami, but uh, my direct family, everybody, fi- actually made it through. Uh, but not uh, it can't say the same thing for for some of their friends and their direct direct relationships. But uh, that was very very um, unsettling experience. But what really made it even more uh, helpless was that this, the day after the tsunami, when uh, Fukushima. Daiichi right. started to melt, get the meltdown and, and explode it. Uh, uh, it also put basically a, a stop to the whole idea of going to help my family in, in Miyagi. Because exactly. that was that was the first twenty four hours. I was I was I was trying to figure out what can I do? Can I go there? You know, how can we help? Yeah. And then within twenty four hours, that became increasingly um, uh, an impossible idea. So it's basically this invisible wall of radiation or radiation, you know. Uh, uncertainty became a stopper but also became a direct risk for my own family my daughter at the time was around seven years old right. and being from Holland and remembering Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl and 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 those you know that that memory came back and said well uh, where is that cloud going to go and immediately you know started to look at the internet you know where you know what's happening right and uh, very limited information, and it so happened that uh, you know my my network, we, we my good friends Joe Ito, we were talking online and say where can we get Geiger counters? He happened to be at that time not in Japan, he was in Boston, right. but his wife was here. We were all kind of scrambling, and then other people got online, and we started to talk about uh, what can we do. And there was a third person, Sean Bonner, he was in LA, uh, and we started to talk three of us. You know what can we do something about? Is lack of information because that is kind of the, the key thing. You know, you, why would you run away if there is no danger? In in case of instead of running away, maybe we should stay here and help people. Right. So, what is the right decision? If you don't have information, you tend to take the uncertain for certain. And I know quite a few people did that, yep. and I think that makes perfect sense. Yep. Uh, but I didn't want to go. I, I wanted to stay because my family is here. Uh, also, my heart is here. So I said, what can I do? So that kind of became. Um, a trigger for doing something. So then we wandered around a couple of weeks. Initially, uh, the idea was to uh, see if we could become kind of an information hub for information about radiation and, and, and the disaster. So we started to look around the internet and seeing, you know, in Japan, are there any other sources of measurement? Can we can we consolidate them? Can we put them on a single map? Um, none of that was realistic. All the information that was available was very limited. Whatever was available was was in the wrong area. Or was copyright protected, or simply not accessible, so right. we couldn't really do much. So our map 
it was very empty. It had a few, you know, it had a few dots around Tokyo, but nothing in 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 Tohoku. So that was uh, basically a fail after a week or so. Then we kind of said, okay, you know, let's do crowdsourcing. Let's buy as many Geiger counters as we can, and then give these to people, and then hopefully they can report. So actually, we set up a website where people could start reporting radiation levels if they had a Geiger counter. But as you may remember Gaga Counter sold out literally in 24 hours. I was going to say, like, the concept of going out and buying a Geiger Counter after March 11th, 2011, was an impossibility because yes. even people who didn't even understand what a Geiger Counter was went out and bought one. Right. It was kind of weird, you know, exactly. and so suddenly you had need for something you never, you didn't even know existed. Exactly. And, uh, but, but the, the, uh, uh, the thing sold out, and the problem is, is that the core part of a Geiger counter, the Geiger, so-called Geiger tube, is only manufactured by a few companies worldwide, and they have very limited capacity, capacity to produce. So yeah. not only was it sold out, the lead time increased from six months to 12 months. So we're kind of stuck with it. So we actually did a Kickstarter campaign at that time to collect money to actually build something. Uh, but on because on we, Kickstarter itself? On Kickstarter itself, and we got money actually to buy those those Geiger counters, which I just talked about. And the thing is, we couldn't buy them, so we said, "What do we do now?" But the, the good thing is, is we had collected a, an amazing group of people on the internet that uh, uh, that that got together to kind of starting to talk about this and starting to help each other and say, "What you know, what can we do?" We were at that time we had a few Geiger counters that were donated by uh, a person by the name of Dan Saiti. He was actually. Uh, involved in, in the Ch- Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, and right. he had a small company that was making these devices. So we had a literally handful of these. Uh, then another person that joined uh, joined and helped us out was a person named Ray Ozzy. Uh, he uh, was, uh, if you're familiar with Ray Ozzy, he was the one who funded with Ray Ozzy. He funded Lotus he, One Two Three, yeah. Funded Lotus Notes and with everything Kapoor, with Mitch Kapoor, so we, yeah. So. Yeah, so we were extremely blessed to have uh, have his uh, uh, his input. So he came up with the idea: if we have only limited, why don't we? Try to put them on a car and drive them around. I saw that. So, and so, and so, you know, and nobody ever had done that before. So this was like, and and some of the so-called scientists that were in this space said, "Oh, you can't do this, this and that, or whatever." So of course we did it. Of course. And uh, and so we we uh, together with with people that were here at Tokyo Hackerspace and other people who were interested, we started to build a prototype of something that could be put on a car and could automatically measure. We did some experiments, we did something before that just actually see the overall idea would work at all. So we had uh, a, a vol- he was a uh, David Kell, he was a volunteer with um, uh, with, a, with a group that was bringing up food right. to uh, Second Harvest was the group, a great group. Uh, second harvest. It was only the second harvest, and they were bringing up food and relief goods up to uh, Tohoku, Fukushima, etc. And so we gave him a Gaga counter and a mobile phone. and said, "Can you measure along the way?" So he did that. We said, "Okay, hey, wow, interesting." But we also saw that the levels were a whole lot higher than we could see on NHK TV. So we knew something, uh, uh, you know, something more was happening there. Uh, so we automated that process. It's very similar to what Google does with Street View. It's basically it's driving around every five seconds. The system takes a radiation measurement and collects, you know, and puts the GPS uh, coordinates and the timestamp and the value on a, on an SD card. Right. And that became something which we still call a B uh, B stands for bento. It looks a little bit like a bento box, box you know, yep. lunchbox. And Geige is for Geiger counter. So these things became. Uh, are kind of our workhorse. So we built, hand built, uh, close up, close to 100 of these in the first year. And we started handing them out to people in Fukushima. They started to drive around. And, and over time, we started to basically fill in the, the map with, with radiation data. And that started to really show us that how blotchy uh, the fallout was. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, you know that the 20 kilometer exclusion zone right. uh, had anything to do with where the radiation fallout was. It was okay. kind of a uh, a policy statement uh, more than anything else. Uh, the fallout went all the way up, uh, you know, uh, 80 kilometers in, uh, land inwards, but close to the plant there were also areas that largely were unaffected, like, for example, the city of Iwaki, one of the larger cities in Fukushima, almost didn't get any fallout, while cities like Koryama, Niomatsu, and Fukushima City uh, were very much uh, uh, badly affected. So that became kind of a goal for us. Instead of kind of getting an idea, we said, you know, we need to measure this thing. And also when we met people uh, in Fukushima, we found out that people really wanted to know what what was happening in their own streets, not 
uh, just a measurement at the city hall. Right. Or, Nobody, uh, people are really self-interested in a way. And in this case, I mean, yes. in, in the most positive way, not in a selfish yes. way. They really want to know, like, can my children eat the food coming out of the right. ocean in my town, right. basically? Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of funny because you mentioned sel- selfish, but I think it is kind of a selfish attitude that humans have in general to Absolutely. protect themselves. Yeah, it's self-interest. And, it's, and, and, you know, you protect your children, you protect your family, and, you know, so you, that's kind of a selfish self-interest. But the selfish interest is important because uh, it allows – it drives people to do something. Correct. And, uh, and it drives almost any person to do something. You know, well, some other people, you know, to overcome your selfishness, to become selfishness, etc., requires an additional level of, of, of energy, I think. Uh, but for, for everybody worries about themselves, their family, etc. So we had lots of volunteers that literally just worried about themselves and their neighborhoods. And they used the so-called big IGs to start measuring those neighborhoods. So if you do that at a larger scale, literally, you know, it's like crowdfunding in right. kind of a chaotic manner. It's very much like, like you know, we talked about distributed trust networks. It's really like that. And so people in different parts of a city start measuring. But also what, what happens is they, they don't know who, who is measuring elsewhere. Uh, in in safe cost, we don't uh, coordinate where people measure. We help people to get the equipment. They decide where they measure. So what happens is, is and this is kind of by design, people will measure the same spot at least a couple of times because the same, you know, in the same neighborhood, we'll have more people than one person measure, and that kind of creates kind of an automatic verification as well. So you it, know, it almost and, it almost sounds like the blockchain, just a human. Oh, well, version. you know, it it's is, kind right? of interesting. And I'm not, saying that, of, I'm not saying that by accident. It sounds to me. Yeah, and I'll let you say it as well because it is interesting, but it sounds to me like the concept of a block and a blockchain and public verification and all the trust associated right. with the group verification yes. is something that humans do naturally anyway. Uh, exactly. And, and uh, you yeah. know, if, you, if you study the history of money or whatever, you'll find out money is actually a trust network. But, Absolutely. Uh, so if, if you look at, if you look at what, what happened with the measurements is that actually a group of people that don't know each other in other words, wouldn't trust each other. Exactly. We're collecting more or less in a random fashion data about their environment, but by by putting it in the same on the same map and overlaying it, it creates an automatic verification. So we were able to build trust out of a uh, out of a non trusted uh, group of people. Not that the people wouldn't trust each other after they would meet each other, but they would never meet each other. Right, so. so, yeah. so and that is kind of the trick, similar to, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with, with Bitcoin, as you were saying, you, you know, Bitcoin, the big thing is, is if, if there's a majority of, of, uh, of miners, then the whole thing will fall over, right? right. That's the same thing in SafeCost. The whole idea is, is that we don't have a dominant uh, contributor to the project, so we really thrive on as many as different volunteers as possible to collect data using the same equipment and the same methodology, but by putting it together, we're able to create, uh, you know, an environmental uh, map that basically uh, trumps any type of government uh, activity trying to do the same. I like it. So what's been the so, so I want to back up and talk about this concept of a human a human blockchain and the concept of these people wouldn't know each other but they trust each other and the fact that they can meet in a way where they're working on a similar project and nobody is more self interested than any other creates. An environment where people are actually willing to verify and self-verify. It just all sounds like a white paper. Um, yes. So can you can you make the equivalency between that and what goes on in actually in the real technology world and how those two things are related? Yes. Actually, you, you were mentioned it sounds like a white paper. We actually did write a scientific paper about the whole idea and we published it about a year ago. So. <laughs> tell me, tell me. So, Yes, no, it's, it was published in uh, uh, in a journal for uh, uh, ra- radiological protection. It's a forty year old, uh, well established scientific journal, uh, quite prestigious. It took us uh, close to a year uh, to get it published in terms of peer reviews, all the scientific checks and balances. It was published about a year ago in June two thousand sixteen. Interestingly enough, it ended What's up in the top ten of most read papers for that journal in two thousand sixteen. What's the name of the paper? And the name of the paper, I can. Can you send um, me the link? I want to see the yeah, link. Yeah, I'll send you the link. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link in a second. It's, it has a long title, of course, a scientific course. paper. So I'd rather give you the link than uh, trying to make a mistake. Um, so, <laughs> but we wrote it uh, as, as a, a means to basically share, you know, kind of the thinking around and behind uh, how we work. Um, yeah, so so that that is uh, something. So you were talking. Sorry, I, I lost the, the the context of the question. So I just want to understand. I want to understand how. So. Here's the idea, right? Safecast says 
among other things, that, so I'm going to simplify a whole bunch of little concepts here, right? But SafeCast basically says there's been a massive disaster and earthquake in the Fukushima and Sendai area in Japan. But nobody really knows and nobody really has data to know what's going on, not just overall, right? So you talked about the 20-kilometer zone. If I remember correctly, in Chernobyl, they did an 80-kilometer zone, right? So they had an 80-kilometer radius around, around, um, around the power plant. And they said nobody's allowed in here for 30 years or whatever it was. They killed all the livestock and sort of evacuated everybody. So in, in Japan, you're saying, I don't know how much radiation is there. I don't know where it's concentrated. I don't know how far it's drifted away. I don't know what the impact is. How can we measure it? And how can we get people to just understand the whole concept of it? And then how can we kind of crowdsource all of that data? The, only, the real question is, though, is how can you trust an individual self-interest to actually properly measure, to tell you the truth, Right, because you can game what's going on on any individual piece of technology and Geiger counter, and yet you end up with a situation where there's not just self-verification, but group verification on all that data. And it just sounds to me a lot like the blockchain. Yes, and uh, it's a very essential question. So if you think about, uh, uh, first of all, we expect our governments to, to measure our environment. Yes. Uh, to be very frank, it's a very big expectation. Uh, we're very far away from actually even being close to that. But um, the problem with that model is is that we, we put trust in one single entity. If that entity loses trust for whatever reason, for good or bad reasons, then whatever that entity collects in terms of data will be mistrusted. And um, uh, so that is and, – and rebuilding the trust is very, very hard. Even today, if you go to Fukushima, you'll find many, many people still do not trust whatever a Japanese government is measuring, right. irrespectively of all the effort and whatever they're trying to do uh, aside. That is kind of – even after six years, where, where lots of people are, so that's kind, you know, that's kind of a, a you know a big dilemma if you work uh, in these things in, as, as a central organization. So SafeCast, uh, we're by the way we're a volunteer organization. We're not uh, we're not a company. We're no profit, but uh, we we you know the, the whole idea is is that people individually measure. Uh, one thing that is common between all the people is is they use the same equipment and the same sensor. This was something we decided from day one. So Passive, for consistency, get, right? For consistency. And, you know, and some people say, you know, is it really accurate or whatever? The real thing that is important is, is can we compare values between locations right. uh, with, with the level of consistency? You talk about, rel- you talk about relative information, re- right? So relative information. Same, yeah. Of course, the equipment we use actually uses very good sensor. It's been calibrated in laboratories over time, blah, blah, blah. But the real, the real treat is that you can compare A with B. And that makes it powerful. And if, if people use the, the equipment collectively, then you can start comparing things. And, of course, you know people. Uh, people can uh, fest the data. You can put the Geiger counter in a in a lead bag, or you can you can strap uh, some radioactive material on it, and you can you know say, oh, it's very high in Tokyo, or look how low Tokyo is, or right, whatever. Right. Uh, so this this is a given, and you you know, and because you, you know we do not uh, know if the person is trustworthy, and there is no. We have no process whatsoever to check who the volunteer is, and right. we allow anybody to participate. So this is very important uh, that you know in, in safe causes we're not a pro-nuclear or anti-nuclear group. We're a right. pro-data group. Right. You're not taking so a view. Yeah, we're not taking a view. So we we believe as long as you follow the, the same process, you you can be a volunteer. Uh, in safe costs. And it means that, you know, there could be people there that have an agenda or whatever. And of course, you know, we have many volunteers that have very different opinions about sure. uh, many, many things. But one thing that kind of connects the thing is, is let's use, you know, let, let's use data to, to drive our, to drive our, our thinking. So, so what happens is if multiple people measure the same location, and let's say one person is, is, is has a, for example, the sensor could be broken for that matter. Yep. It doesn't even have to be a malintent, the sensor could be broken. Because things overlay, you can actually see uh, when things are kind of out of expected range. That doesn't mean that the data is wrong. It could be uh, something that is happening right there, right now. Uh, also, by the way, if you measure radiation, that you may you may know that some people go for uh, uh, specific medical procedures where they are temporarily, uh, you know, in, ingest, they ingest uh, radioactive material. Correct. And that takes a couple of days to, to fizzle out. And if you stand next to a person, your Geiger counter will go uh, haywire. Crazy, right. <laughs> right, so least. And sometimes we see that, you know, in a, in a busy train station or somebody who passes a hospital, we sometimes have these, these kind of, you know, one-time hotspots, so to speak. Uh, but so, so you see those things. And because people that participate, um, uh, you know, have declared themselves, if you want to, you know, if, you, if you're going to run around like, like an idiot trying to, to break the system, you will just show up as that idiot right. breaking the system, right. okay? So, 
so you, you're doing this. You're, you're even if you're anonymous, you still are. The data that is collected is immediately made public data. So we publish all our data under a Creative Commons zero license. That's basically that. public domain. Yep. So anybody can examine it. So it's not safe cost data anymore. And the other thing that's important is is that the people that have measured keep the copy of their data as well. It's on an SD card in uh, with you on your machine or whatever. So even if if in safe cost we start hacking the database or whatever, everybody that participates has their own copy still. They can always check back and say, hey, whatever is, is on the safe cost database, is that actually what I contributed? They, right. they can verify that back and forward as well. So there's many, you know, lot, you know, there's many natural ways it kind of balances. Um, all systems have weaknesses and you can go and, and sit around and, and think through and that's something why, why I'm, I'm looking at things like blockchain and other things as possible ways to even uh, you know, to make this even more robust and what, what, what have you. But the natural fact that people check each other actually balances out really well in, in reality. Um, if you are sitting in, in, in a corner and you know you can fist things and nobody is watching you, uh, you know, catch me if you can type of thing, exactly. people may do bad things. But if you put broad daylight on it, everybody can see what you're doing. Uh, humans tend to behave a whole lot more uh, uh, reasonable. Right. I mean, I have a concept that says nothing good happens in the dark. Um, and I think what you're talking about with SafeCast is, and you, you, you started with like government is, as a central entity for trust is probably a mistake that we make, particularly when it comes to the radiation data. But I would say it's actually a metaphor for a much larger mistake that humans make when they centralize kind of all decisions into one entity as an expert in any particular place. And so I like to make these, I like to make these equivalencies. And I think that the government doesn't necessarily try to do anything good, bad, or indifferent in most cases, but whenever there's a central entity that controls all the data, in the SafeCast case, of course, what you're doing is taking that data away from the central control and distributing it, right? So this is the whole concept. But that's also why I believe really strongly that something like blockchain, which does that with all of the data that sits on it, Right? That whole concept is that all the data is distributed, all of it's verified. It means that your ability to have this central control is now not eliminated, but it's disintermediated. And I think when we talk next, and hopefully we will talk next, I'm sure we will, about the impact and the ongoing impact and development of blockchain as a technology that's going to um, sort of become a, a more and more a part of people's lives. The metaphor that you talked about in the context of the government and the control of the data for nuclear information, right, and for radiation is going to have a very similar impact across a whole swath of, I wouldn't even just say industries, but pieces of our life where that data now becomes distributed in public. And you can see, here's the thing though, right, you made a really good point. You can now see the outliers in that data. So measurements that are way too high. And again, in some cases it is because someone's self-interested in trying to get something based on that data or just there's a person next to you who went to the hospital, like you said, who's randomly standing next to you at a train station, or you're driving past them if you're, measure, if you're making those measurements in a car. But I think that's what makes this whole concept of distributed data really interesting, and SafeCast is a really great test for this sort of metaphorical idea that decentralizing the trust and the data is actually not a bad idea. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think just to come back on, on governments, I think, you know, if we're looking back uh, over the last few uh, few years, and specifically over the last year with some of the things that are happening in the U.S., where, where, where we have taken things way too, too much for granted uh, uh, in terms of how governments can behave or can change uh, dramatically, and specifically when it comes to control over data or how data is managed. And... Uh, uh, in the case of Japan, I think Japan wasn't ready for, obviously, for this disaster. No. But also the technology, the scientists, the engineers, nobody had ever thought about how. what do we do if we really have a disaster like right. this? How do we measure it? Right. So, you know, the whole idea to, to have, you know, to go out with, you know, the gov Japanese government had a bunch of Geiger counters, to go out and go measure in the field uh, was kind of completely not realistic. And they never had thought it would be such a big field. But uh, at the same time, I think that, you know, expecting too much from the government is, I think, is kind of, you know, is kind of naive. Exactly. And I think when those things happen, I, I think it is, you know, and I was, I was definitely, uh, you know, part of that, you know, uh, we as citizens are not kind of the, the end consumer that, you know, will, you know, it waits patiently to be, to, to get something on, presented on a, on a silver plate. We have, an, I think, an obligation and the power and the abilities to, to stand up and do something and, and team up. And 
I think those are the, the opportunities for, for communities and, and, and people living in communities to say, okay, this is something we never had. Why don't we build it now? Right. And I think with, if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the amazing advance over the last 10 years in terms of mobile technology, uh, 3D printing, uh, some of the IoT stuff, open source, open, you know, open hardware, all of these things have made it increasingly possible to to do things that were completely, in, you know, in, inimaginable ten years ago in terms of quickly being able to build systems, infrastructure, communities, etc. It's really a very different ball game altogether. The internet, obviously, being the big connector, allowing it all all of that to happen. You can order any little tiny part within a day. You can assemble something in a week's time. You can be on the road. Uh, the, the day after that that type of uh, empowerment is is entirely there i think that creates opportunities to as you said to to build systems that can verify but also it creates i think a healthy dialogue between citizens and their and their central governments or local governments to say you know uh, what do we expect from you but how can i participate in that and by participating you're not only uh, yeah, say let's measure something or whatever, but you also get engaged much more into that. Uh, in in SafeCast, we started off with measuring radiation, but uh, over the last two years or so, we have been increasingly working on how can we measure air quality and air pollution. Right, same thing, um, right. And and it's the same uh, same thing. It is it's something that plays. Uh, all over the world, we're talking about uh, things like uh, global warming. But uh, the problem is, is that engagement with global warming is very limited uh, for the reason that it doesn't directly affect your lives in a way that is that is visible. Yet. However, what? Yes. Yet. I would say yet. Uh, yet. Yes. No, it does, you know, it, I agree with you, not yet or whatever, but it does not in a way that people start to say, oh, my God, I need to do something. They read it in the newspaper and say, oh, my God. But in terms of really... Uh, at local community level, but if you talk about air pollution or whatever, most people do worry about it because it does affect your health. And uh, if that is connected to global warming or not, that is something where people, I think, are can um, you know can much more easily understand that yeah, hey, I don't want this. And uh, that type of engagement, I think, is important to do, go and do something about things. So I think air pollution and measuring that at local levels is, I think, is a very important thing. And so we have been. Uh, on many, many people's requests, we have been working on that. And uh, this year, uh, we have uh, come out with a with a new uh, version of our of our systems called the SolarCast, which is a system that is measuring both air pollution and radiation. Uh, it's very easy to deploy, and we're now doing you know testing and trying this out and see how we can build a network of these these sensors and get a much better idea of uh, air pollution at a much more granular level in cities or wherever. So that we can really start understanding is how is that affecting us and where is it coming from? How could we potentially do something about it? I think that's fascinating, actually. And this is a perfect place to end. The last thing I want to ask you is how do you fund SafeCast? If it's a, if it's a non, is it a registered nonprofit organization? And how does, yes, it, how does uh, it get funded? Yes, uh, we are a, a non-profit. We are registered in the U.S. as a uh, as a non-profit organization. We're registered in Japan as a non-profit, and we have a non-profit in Europe. And this is basically to allow people to donate uh, uh, to to the cause. Uh, the way we work is in two fields. We lots of the, the donations are in kind. Many people spend their time measuring and spend their time helping the project. So we have lots of people in the field. We, at this point in time, I think over the last six years, we have almost now collected 75 million measurements. Wow. And we're doing about 2 million measurements a month. And obviously, running a project that scale requires people and continuous engagement. So uh, we have a project team of people that are working on it, largely volunteer. Uh, but we collect uh, donations to basically run our logistics, uh, pay for equipment, pay for, you know, we do a lot of uh, reach out events, right. uh, seminars, uh, and things like that. So, and that is very much something that uh, depends on donations. Well, and, let's, let's, uh, let's, um, let's try to use the power of the internet and the podcast to get more donations. I mean, if there's a link as well for how people can connect to yes. cast the organization and where they can sort of make donations. I'd like to highlight that if that's okay with you. Sure. Yes, I'll, I'll share uh, the link uh, after after the, the call is over. That would be super. You can just put it into the Skype chat. Look, let's do this. Yes. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to just talk to us. I think this has been fabulous, and I, I really believe this is just the beginning of a conversation, not just about the technology, but how technology affects humans and groups and how the blockchain is going to get used for a whole bunch of different things that people haven't even conceptualized yet. So I'd like to sort of have a, 
a tacit agreement that we're going to get back on the phone again, maybe in a few months, just to f- sort of follow up. If for no other reason than I was there on September, on, on March 11th as well. I remember, yes. I remember the confusion, the fear. I remember, so I was sitting on a trading desk at 2.47 in the afternoon on Friday. And I know that feeling, just like you said, I'd been there at the point for 21 years as well. And when an earthquake hit, it was just like people would look at each other and just say those two words, right? Jishin des. Right? Yes. It's an earthquake. You'd be like, yeah, sure, fine. Let's just move on because there are earthquakes almost every day. Some of them you yes. feel, some of them you don't. And yet this yes. one just didn't stop. And you're right. If you're sitting on the 20th floor of the new Otani Garden Court building and the shaking and shaking and shaking, you can only begin to imagine what it must have been like, right? Um, up near Sendai, up near Fukushima, and just that fear and that feeling of just complete lack of control. And the idea that SafeCast grew out of this and the ability to sort of measure and help test and, like you say, just get people involved. And if you can extrapolate that further into the future with things like SolarCast and the creation of data and this sort of distribution of not just responsibility but data collection, I think, is really powerful. Yes. No, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy to talk again for sure. I think we have a few things in common. We should definitely uh, reconnect. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you again, Peter Franken. That was great. Michael, thank you so much. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.